So if I don't sell you anything, can I start there? I'm not going to sell you anything. Um, for those of you that get to know me, I don't like selling. I'm one of those guys that I know we're all in sales, right? Raise your hand if you're in sales. We're all in sales. I'm in sales. I don't like selling. I don't like it. I love presenting. It poses a challenge, though, right? Because there's a time when you have to close somebody in sales. There's a time you have to ask for the sale. And I, my whole life, my whole career, I've struggled with it. And so they were talking earlier about uh, rock bottom. So just real quick, I've, I've had a couple of hum, humdinger rock bottoms. I remember driving to work one day about 15 years ago. And on my way to work, there was not enough gas in my car to get home. I had no money in my pocket for lunch. I had no idea what I was going to do for lunch or how to get home that day. I remember thinking to myself, this sucks. And I don't like it. And I'm never going to be here again. So I'm going to do whatever it takes. And so if you look at my Facebook, if you're friends with me on Facebook, my, my caption on Facebook says, I learned a long time ago that I can get a lot more done in a 12-hour workday than others get done in an 8-hour workday. So that's, that's my secret, is I'm just going to outwork you. You might be smarter than me. You might be more talented than me. You could be a better closer than me. But I'm going to outwork you. And I'm, out, I'm going to outgrind you, and I'm going to get that deal. Because I, I want it that bad, because I never want to be in that situation again, ever ever, never, right? And so I'm hungry for it every single day. And hopefully, the, the lessons you guys are getting here today allow you to take your business to the next level. And what I want to try and share with you is the secret that I had to create for myself to get over this not liking to sell. So I had to, I had to invent something, because I, I love being in, in this industry, so I, had to, I, I needed a crutch. So I invented what I've learned to call the law of disproportionate value. So raise your hand if you've heard of the law of disproportionate value. Oh, that's awesome, because I invented it. <laughs> it's all good. Um, so law of disproportionate value, it allows me to get into a situation where the value proposition to the person in front of me seems grossly disproportionate for them in their favor. So I get an instant yes all the time, every time, because there's no way for this person in front of me to say no. I'm going to give you guys a quick example. Somebody in the room right now who has a $10 bill or two fives in your pocket right now. Raise your hand. Bring your $10 bill. Bring it up. No, I'm not going to give you $100. That's Sam. Whoever has a $10 bill, come on up. There we go. Hold on. So hold on. We're going to do a transaction. This is, a, this is a, my version of disproportionate value. You have a $10 bill. I have a $20 bill. Would you like to trade? Yep. Oops, sorry. Hold on. You didn't have to think about it? Nope. That's it. That is the law of disproportionate value. Now, how? <laughs> Hold on. Oh. Ooh, is there anybody here that would like to say no? Oh, you want to think about it? No. No, you're good. Thank you. So if you can do that in business, Right? By, by the way, does anybody here want to do that same transaction? Yeah, everybody. Right? So if your customers perceive doing business with you is that, that if I do business with this person, that's what I get. Everybody says yes. If your friendships, if your relationships, if your, your spousal relationships, your child relationship, whatever that is, if they perceive the disproportionate values in place, they say yes immediately. And I hate no. You get to know me, I hate rejection more. Oh my god, I fear it. I don't like it. Um, I used to have a, a phobia of, of calling, right? You guys ever, it's time to make your calls, right? And you're like, yeah, but I'm hungry. I'm just going to, right? And you procrastinate it. Yeah, that was me. I still do every once in a while. I, 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 I talk about I'm, I'm busy, right? And then I, I, I recently got a clicker, one of those number clickers, and I can't leave the office until I've, I've clicked enough calls for the day, right? So that's my solution for that. But so how do you create the law of disproportionate value without going bankrupt, without literally giving $20 for $10, right? How do you do that? So the way you do it is you create a unique value proposition, unique value proposition, keyword unique. So there's two rules that come with a unique value proposition, two key fundamental rules of unique value proposition. First rule, it can never have anything to do with service, ever. Second rule, it can never have anything to do with price, ever. If your unique value proposition, your script, any part of your script says service or price, it is not unique. You know why? Because everybody else is saying the same thing. 
Everybody else in this room is saying the exact same thing. Therefore, you're not unique. The moment I hear a realtor on a listing presentation talking about service and open houses and this marketing and that marketing, that's all service-based, right? And if they're interviewing multiple realtors, guess what the other realtors are saying? Service and price. And in the absence of value, price becomes the issue. And that's when they start asking you, well, will you do your listing for 5% instead of 6%? Well, the guy down the street, he'll do it for 5%. The moment you hear that, there is no perception of value. You haven't hit it. Right? And you got you to own that. And you, when you combine a unique value proposition with leverage, so here's what leverage is. Leverage is when someone will do something for you just because you asked. That's it. There is no other reason. You ask, they do. You have leverage. If you ask, and if you ask somebody to do something and they ask you why, or I don't think so, all that means is there's no leverage. So how do you get leverage? What, and, and who has leverage over you? Who has leverage over me? So an example for me is I'm a self-proclaimed mama's boy. I love my mom. She's an angel from heaven. And when my mom calls me and says, son, it would make me very happy if whatever comes after that, I'm probably going to do. Why? Because she's got leverage, right? My mom's got leverage over me. Now, because my mom has leverage over me, do, am I upset at her for having leverage over me, or do I welcome it? I welcome it because she's earned it, right? So nobody's going to begrudge you for you getting leverage, right? It means you've done something to earn it, right? And so if somebody, your clients, whoever you're trying to get to do something, that's part of selling, presenting, there's, I, need, I need an action item here. If you can apply unique value proposition with leverage, your business does this, and it does it fast. So, I'm going to tell you how this came about in my life, a quick little story. Have you guys heard my accent yet? You guys figured out where I'm from? I'm not from California. I'm Canadian. Out and about. Does that help? We haven't figured out how to round. I don't say A anymore, but, but I can't figure out how to stop rounding my O's. So, in, I had to move to the United States. I had to go through the immigration process. Raise your hand if you've got a friend or a family member that's ever gone through the immigration process. Yeah, well, most of the people here. OK, so it's an incredibly not fun experience. Like, it makes the DMV look like a cakewalk. And so 1999, I sell my whole life in Canada. I moved to the United States. I got a, 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 an approval from a bank on a loan. And, and so they gave me a condition sheet. Right? And the condition sheet, one of the conditions was I needed a social security number to get the loan. Totally makes sense. So I sell my whole life. I move. I'm now in the United States, and I'm about to start the immigration process. That, there's a mistake, right? <laughs> Should have started before I moved. No, I'm, I, I'm quick to go. Got to go, right? We're all in sales, so ADD. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Right, so um, I started interviewing attorneys, and the, every immigration attorney is quoting me the same thing. So this is 1999. They're all quoting me $2,000, and it's going to take three months to get my Social Security number. And I said, no, no, you guys, you're not listening. Focus. Three weeks. I got three weeks. What has to happen for me to get it in three weeks? And they're all dismissing me, saying, yeah, it's not going to happen. So a friend of mine says, no, you're talking to the wrong guy. You got, got to this guy. His name is Jerry Ingber. You might want to write that down <laughs> when you hear this story. So Jerry Ingber, I go to his office. I sit down. He comes in, you know, niceties, starts asking me questions, taking notes. Why are you moving to the US, et cetera, et cetera. 15 minutes goes by. He's got all his questions down. He says, yes, I can help you. I said, great. Three weeks? He said, yes, you'll have your social security number in three weeks, you'll have your green card in three months, and you'll be a citizen in three years. I'm in front of the man. This is him. Hold on, what just happened? He, oh, he's got leverage over me now, right? So what's the next question I got to ask? How much? So hold on, so now I know I got to ask this question. I'm looking around the office, all of a sudden I realize, oh, this is a fancy office. <laughs> I didn't notice though right now, but I now is, oh. Uh, you know what, everybody's quoting me $2,000. I, I can already smell this is going to be four. He's, he's double. I already know it. Right? So I said, by the way, Mr. Ingrid, if I could ask, what does it cost for your services? He said, well, it's $5,000 for your, your social security number. It's $5,000 for your green card. And it's $5,000 for your citizenship. $15,000. Right? And I swear, I didn't, I didn't even blink. I, kept my, I swear I kept a smile on my face. And I looked at him, and, and, and I said, um, I don't suppose that number is negotiable. And he looked at me and he kind of turned his head and said, it was very, very nice meeting Mr. Mitchell, shook my hand and left me in the conference room. Just walked out. Right, and I'm like, no! 
What just happened? Right? Because what's he got over me? Leverage. He's got a unique value proposition, and he's got leverage because I don't want what he has. I need what he has. Right? So the receptionist comes in, shushes me out, validates my parking, says, thank you very much. They close the door. I'm like, so I, you know what? Let me give it a day. I call back the office the next day. I said, hi, it's Eric Mitchell from yesterday. Is Mr. Ingber available? Receptionist says, I'm sorry. He's in meetings all day. Can I take a message? Yeah, OK. So now I'm being, I, I'm getting the Heisman. Got it. OK, so I, I learned a valuable question in my life that has served me. Um, knowing what you know, knowing that I don't know what you know, if you were me, what would you do? You should write that question down. Knowing what you know, knowing that I don't know what you know, if you were me, what would you do? And you can apply it to all things in life. And you'll be amazed at the answers that come back to you. So I said to the receptionist, knowing what you know about Mr. Ingber, knowing that I don't know what you know about what happened yesterday, if you could advise me, if you were me, what would you do right now to get Mr. Ingber to come to the phone? She said, well, I would apologize. I tell you what, if you can get Mr. Ingber to come back to the phone, I swear, the only words coming out of my mouth are going to be, I am sorry. She said, one moment, please. A minute later, Jerry Ingber speaking. <laughs> OK, Mr. Ingber, it's Eric Mitchell from yesterday. First thing I want to say is I am so sorry to have offended you yesterday. Listen to me. I am so sorry to have offended you yesterday. How much leverage this guy got over me? <laughs> Brutal. Brutal amount of leverage. Can you imagine if you had this amount of leverage over your clients? How, how much more fun would your job be? And I'm going to get there, I promise. So um, if you could let me know what it is that I could do that would allow me to re-engage your services, I would be forever grateful. And his next script. I, I haven't been able to say it yet. Not yet. I pray one day I get to say this to somebody at some point. It's been since 1999 till today, I haven't been able to say it other than talking about the story. But I swear I want to say it to a customer just one day. He said, Eric, for me to do business with somebody, three things have to be in play. Number one, I have to know that I can help you. After meeting with you yesterday, I know that I can. Number two, you have to be able to afford my services. And that's a choice for you to make. Number three, I have to like you. And right now, number three is not on the table. <laughs> and my brain is melting. So meanwhile, what's he got? He's got leverage. So I said, I tell you what, Mr. Stringer, if you could let me know what it is that I could do that would allow number three to come back onto the table. He said, you can bring me a check for $5,000. Down to his office, $5,000. I had a social security number in three weeks, a uh, green card in three months, and I was a citizen in three years. And for that three-year relationship, who was in charge? He was in charge. I brought him coffee. <laughs> I, showed up with, I showed up with coffee. Yes, Mr. Ingram. Thank you, Mr. Ingram. Is there anything else you can do, Mr. Ingram? Right? So that is my wish for anybody in sales, is to make your life easier by having leverage and a unique value proposition that creates the law of disproportionate value. Now, I'm paying him $15,000 over three years, and in my brain, it's still disproportionate. I remember the first time we went to a, an INS line, which we got there at 9 o'clock in the morning, and the line, I, no exaggeration, 12 blocks. Literally 12 blocks to get into this office. And I show up going, uh, what? No, hey, no, and no, no, not with Jerry Ingber. Right to the front of the line, right past, we're in and out in 30 minutes. Oh, yeah, hold on, that's a lot of disproportionate value. I, yes, Mr. Ingber, thank you. Here's a coffee, Mr. Ingber, right? And so what is the value proposition that you're bringing to the table? And so it can never be service or price. You've got to eliminate that language from your activities. You've got to just eliminate it. If somebody's asking you a price, well, yeah, no, we'll get to price. What I really want to talk to you about is what's valuable to you. We'll get to price. We'll get to service. We'll get to that stuff. I mean, yeah, yeah, but I need to really understand. So think of it in, in these terms. If you're a realtor or a loan officer in the room, and you have somebody walking into your office trying to sell you something, a title rep, an escrow rep, a home warranty rep, somebody, and they walk into your office and say, here's my rate sheet. We've got really great rates and really great service. If you give us a try, I promise we'll earn your business for life. Thank you so much. And they leave the office. What happens to that sheet of paper? Right in the trash. And yet realtors think that a listing is actually listening to you, doing the same, same speech. No. No, they're not. They're not listening to you. 
right? And so you got to get off that script. And so an example, if you are a realtor right now and you've ever lost a deal to an all cash offer, you've got a client that needs financing and you submitted in a multiple offer situation and you lost a deal because some other offer was an all cash offer, raise your hand if, you, if that's ever happened to you. Most of the room. Okay, would you like that to never happen again? Now, would you also like to be able to communicate it in a way to your clients where you now have a unique value proposition, plus you have leverage, the client perceives there to be disproportionate value, and they're going to say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, thank you, ma'am, may I have another ma'am? Would that be valuable to you if I gave that to you right now? And is it, is it okay if it's free? <laughs> I like free. So, by the way, it's my favorite word in the whole English language. Free. I'll take 10. It doesn't matter what it is. It's free. I, yes. Okay, so would you guys agree that this is a California purchase, residential purchase agreement, page two, loan terms, right? One, two, three, four, and five. When there's normally a financing contingency, you're dealing with one, two, and three, yeah? You guys have seen this? If you haven't seen this, then you're not writing contracts. You got other problems. We'll get you there. But if you've written contracts, you've seen this, and normally you're talking about loan application, how many days, loan contingency, loan contingency removal, et cetera. But look at number four. What does number four say? No loan contingency. Would you guys like to make offers on properties in this marketplace right now with no loan contingency? Oh, that would just be pretty, wouldn't it? If only that were possible. And if it were possible, how would that work? And how do you script it so that your clients perceive it to be valuable? So if you're talking to a buyer and, you, and, and the buyer says, why should I use you as your, my buyer's agent? Why you? Well. Here's why you use me. If you go to any other realtor in this room or in this marketplace, here's what they're going to do. They're going to refer you to some mortgage person. That mortgage person is going to collect some documents. They're going to write you a pre-approval letter. It's going to be a really fancy schmancy pre-approval letter. It's going to talk about how great you are. And then we're going to go find your home. We're going to make an offer. And on that offer, we're going to check box one, two, and three. They're going to check box one, two, and three and submit an offer. But if you're in a multiple offer situation, there's an all cash offer, you're going to lose that deal. Or you're going to have to raise your offer amount by 20, 30, 40, 50,000 dollars to compete against an all-cash offer. So that's what everybody else does in the market. But if you do business with me, what I'm going to show you do, how to do is we're going to check box four, no loan contingency, compete against all-cash offers, and it's free of charge. That's why you want to do business with me. Oh, by the way, as a buyer's agent, I'm free. Right? Might you get some leverage over that client because you're talking about something unique. So what we discovered. Um, in my uh, journey, uh, I was, have you, have you guys ever heard of Craig Proctor? Right, he's, um, he's a real estate trainer, coach, he's like Tom Perry, Mike Perry. So Craig Proctor is the uh, number one REMAX agent in the world. He did 300 transactions a year for 15 years in a row. Personal, personal business, right? So I was his mortgage partner for two years. Uh, I just inked a deal, you know, thankfully, using these same strategies where we're now there their national partner. But from this strategy, this one strategy, we were able to lock down about 8,000 realtors that want to participate in this, right? Because of the value proposition. And so what I've tried to do is surround myself with the best of the best, right? If you've got a guy who's closing 300 transactions a year, 15 years in a row, would you say he knows what he's doing? Yeah, so when he says this is what's valuable, all I say is that must be it and I'm just gonna do that, right? Because he knows. And so we created this based on what he says we need in this marketplace. So I am with Gold Star. We've got a booth. And we do this. So we remove loan conditions prior to you making offers. We don't write. If you want a pre-approval letter, we're happy to write you one. But what's better is we're going to take that client all the way through underwriting. We're going to waive the loan contingencies in writing. And you're going to make an offer the same as all cash. That's our value proposition. And hopefully, it's valuable to you guys as well.